The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Good evening, I'm Jennifer Rabb, and it's my great privilege to be the president of this extraordinary institution, Hunter College, and to welcome you all tonight to this important discussion of John Lindsay, New York, and the American Dream. For many here this evening, myself included, it was Lindsay who drew us into public service. I was an eight-year-old girl in Washington Heights when I walked into what he called one of his little city halls, and what I later learned was a political office. But by then it was too late because I had caught the public service bugs, as many of you here tonight. Many of us were inspired by Lindsay and his vision of city government as a vibrant and exciting place to work. It is especially appropriate to hold this event here tonight at Hunter because John Lindsay represented our college along with the rest of the Upper East Side when he was in Congress, and he represented us in his special Lindsay way. There was the time when two bills went to the floor of the House, one to let the Postmaster General impound obscene mail, the other to let him seize mail from communist countries. Lindsay voted against both. When asked how he could oppose legislation to combat pornography and communism, he replied that those were the major industries of his constituency. <laughs> and if there were a shutdown, quote, the 17th district would be a depressed area. And then there was the quintessential Lindsay City snob line. I'm from New York, and I don't trust air that I can't see. <laughs> this evening's event is appropriately sponsored by the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, which is dedicated to establishing the connections and policymaking between the past and the present, since much of this discussion will explore the relevance of the Lindsay legacy to the new New York City administration. That is certainly fitting, since like Bill de Blasio, our new mayor, Lindsay identified himself as a progressive on political and social issues. And Mayor de Blasio must too deal with a governor from the same party, but not always, it would seem, the same point of view. And then there's the most prominent thing these two mayors have in common. They're both so darn tall. <laughs> new York Magazine even ran an article in 1969 headline is Lindsay too tall to be mayor? And he was actually two inches shorter than Bill de Blasio. Roosevelt House sponsorship is also appropriate because it was Lindsay who re renamed what was then called Welfare Island as Roosevelt Island, and then proposed creating a memorial to this great New Yorker on the southern tip. As mayor, Lindsay had many ties to Hunter College, including close associations with two of our most famous graduates. One was Bess Meyerson, whose career in politics he launched when he made her his commissioner of consumer affairs. And then there was the tough hunter girl, Bella Abzug. She helped make Lindsay a feminist, and when he joined forces with her in opposing the war in Vietnam, he helped make her a national figure. She and Lindsay joined forces again when she went to Congress and they worked to steer federal economic aid to the city. Now that relationship wasn't always warm and fuzzy, but then relationships with Bella rarely were. Sid Davidoff, who is here with us this evening, remembers the time Bella was coming up in the front door of City Hall. Mayor Lindsay turned to him and said, you handle her this time, and proceeded to slip out the side door. <laughs> there are so many old friends and distinguished guests here of the Lindsay administration that it's impossible to acknowledge all of them. But I do want to extend on behalf of all of us a special member welcome to the members of the Lindsay family who have joined us tonight. Let's have a round of applause for the wonderful Lindsay family. And finally, there's one person who deserves special recognition because this event, like so many other things in New York, would have never happened without him, and that is Jay Kriegel. It was his vision to hold this conference and to keep the Lindsay family memory alive. Jay also helped conceive the extraordinary book that is the basis of this discussion, Summer in the City, which was edited by Hunter College's own Professor Joe Vitteritti. Dr. Vitteritti is the chair of our Hunter Planning and Urban Affairs Department and the Thomas Hunter Professor of Public Policy. Joe actually graduated from Hunter the same year that Lindsay was re-elected mayor and worked for him that year as a volunteer. 
He went on to write his master's thesis on Lindsay's police department and then did his doctoral dissertation on Lindsay's management reforms. How appropriate to have one of our own and this great Lindsay scholar open our conference. Please join me first in, welcome, in watching the next video clip and then welcoming Dr. Joe Vitteridi to launch our conversation. I'm John Lindsay. I was born in New York City and I've lived here all my life. And I'm running for mayor because I know that our city is in a crisis. Everyone knows the facts about crime, schools, safety, air pollution, water pollution, transportation, and all the rest. But the worst thing of all is the feeling of apathy and indifference that exists among our people. I say that New York City can do a job. I say that our city can lead the country. And I'm prepared to do the job if you'll give me a chance. We need a change, and we need it now. We want jobs! 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 Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> the apparent winner of this election is Mr. John Lindsay. I plan to give New York the most hardworking, and the most dedicated, and I hope the most exciting and successful administration this city has ever seen. John Lindsay is still a hard act to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, next year will be the 50th anniversary from the time that John Lindsay declared his candidacy for mayor. Um, it, was mo it was probably the most exciting decade uh, in post-war American history, I would say one of the most exciting decades in all of American history. It was a period of the civil rights movement, anti-war protest, the sexual revolution, race riots, crumbling cities, and demand for black power. You'll be able to recall a time when you were young enough to believe that you could change the world. I believe that you did, and I think you changed it for the better. Um, we're now experiencing lots of 50th anniversaries from that period. Uh, one is the, is the war on poverty, which started 50 years ago this year. Um, there's a debate going on as whether we won that war or lost that war. My own take on it from the book is that we sort of surrendered midway uh, and got distracted by things like a war in Vietnam and other wars and, and, and actually a war against government. Uh, but there were important accomplishments along the way, even though we didn't finish what was started. Medicare and Medicaid allowed us to provide health services for elderly and poor people that would not have had it otherwise. Food stamps enabled us to feed the hungry that otherwise may not have been fed. Aid to dependent children, as controversial as it was, allowed us to take care of young people the way any decent society should at least try to do. Lindsay was part of that history. Lindsay was a Republican progressive at a time when that term was not an oxymoron. <laughs> Lindsay was a member of the House of Representatives for 50 years. And as many people may not remember, and many Democrats may not want to remember, a higher proportion of Republicans voted for civil rights legislation in the Voting Rights Act and the Great Society legislation than Democrats did because Southern Democrats controlled the committees in Congress and, want, and were not particularly supportive of what was going on in the Johnson White House. When Lindsay became mayor, he walked into a perfect storm. The middle class was leaving the city, being replaced by uh, poorer people who were more dependent on the city for city services. Um, they were taking their tax revenues with them. Um, uh, manufacturing that used to be able to provide jobs for unskilled laborers were disappearing. Uh, and there was an exodus of, of big business that began during the early 60s that was taking tax revenues with them also. John Lindsay was principled, he was bold and courageous, and he wasn't afraid to fail. And he did fail. He made lots of mistakes. He's going to be up here again at the end of the show, and he'll tell you about some of those mistakes himself. He certainly deserved to share some of the blame for the fiscal crisis that evolved in 1975, although, as Charlie Morris said in this book, um, there was plenty of blame to go around. Um, he could have a deaf ear when it came to white working class uh, constituents. And Ocean Hill Brown's vote, for those of you who remember it, 
was an unmitigated disaster, at least in my estimation. But Lindsay had a sense of the future. I, even though that future was, did not seem so inevitable at the time, and he was not preoccupied with political expediency. He chose as his, one of his major constituents black and Puerto Rican and poor people who weren't even voting. Blacks who were coming here from the South did not have the habit of voting because they weren't allowed to. Puerto Ricans who were coming to the city were facing language barriers. So he identified with a very weak political constituency and yet moved, moved the ball along. Um, he opened, uh, he, he did all he could to make government more open and more accessible. Jennifer Raub mentioned neighborhood city halls. There were the Ac Urban Action Task Force that reached into neighborhoods. There was the Office of Neighborhood Government, which became a model for community boards the way they function today. Um, and before anybody was even talking about it, he fought for the rights of women and gays. Lindsay passed an executive ordinance prohibiting discrimination against gays in the workplace. It was the first of its kind in the country. He had a, a uncanny appreciation for what I would call the civic mission of the city that I think uh, was beyond any mayor we've had other than LaGuardia. Um, in his mind, everybody should share with the benefits of urban life. He believed cities were the center of civilization, and he believed everybody should share in that glory, from the rich people to poor. He closed Central Park to vehicles um, and reminded us, this is not a boulevard. This is a place where people should go and enjoy a day and bike and skate and stroll. This is what urban life should be like. Um, I believe that his commitment to the civic mission of, this, of the city has been overshadowed since the fiscal crisis, what I, would, what I would consider a preoccupation with fiscal sovereignty. Since 1965, the number of people voting in city elections has declined 56%. It's more than half. So the number of people who voted in this last mayoral election were 50% fewer than who voted for Lindsay in 65, and it was a constant decline except for 89 when Mayor uh, Dinkins was elected. It, it, there was a little slight bump. In 1965, the, the turnout in the city election was 86% of what it had been in the previous presidential election. This year, it was 44.5%. I think that one of the things that the next mayor needs to do very carefully is think about the civic mission of the, of, of the city and how we're going to reinvigorate that, which brings me to the present and our present mayor, Bill de Blasio. Now, I know there's lots of, lots of comparisons that have been made between him and Lindsay, and I know we have uh, some journalists in the audience who are thinking about these things. Let me give you a couple of points of caution in making those comparisons. Lindsay um, was, in some ways, uh, held back by the labor movement. He inherited a post Bob Wagner labor movement, which, which probably would not have received any mayor well after Bob Wagner. But um, the unions at that point were not really that sympathetic to, to Lindsay's um, racial agenda. And very often, they were, the unions defended what I considered uh, ethnic strongholds that, that occupied various departments. And we saw the worst uh, of that in um, in, in schools and in the police. While Lindsay was able to go to Washington for help, Washington either was behind him or ahead of him on some issues, de Blasio will not be able to do that. Washington is not there. It's not behind you, it's not, it's not ahead of you, it's not anywhere, it's not functioning. And of course, then there's the governor. Mayors and governors in New York never have sweetheart relationships. But in this case, Lindsay had a Republican governor who liked to spend like a Democrat. De Blasio has a Democratic governor who likes to spend like a Republican. And it's gonna be problematic. Um, let me close with one comment. Um, read the book and then we can talk.
For six years, this man has had the second toughest job in America. When you're mayor of New York, your problems don't happen quietly. They explode. And John Lindsay's had them all. Garbage strikes, city hall protests. Sometimes it seems like they never end. And he's won some of the big ones. Half fare transportation for a million senior citizens. A free university education for every high school graduate, black and white. 4,000 more police to fight crime. Cleaner air for the first time in a generation. And when cities all over America went up in flames, John Lindsay put his life on the line and walked the streets to hold New York together. The civil peace has been shattered in a number of cities. The American people are deeply disturbed by the wholesale looting and violence that has occurred both in small towns and in great metropolitan centers. I have welcomed the members of the Commission on Civil Disorders to the White House for its first meeting. That commission is chaired by Governor Kerner of Illinois. The vice chairman is Mayor Lindsay of New York. And if this commission can serve the purpose of focusing the, the nation's attention in some fashion on the needs of these great cities, then it will have done the very important thing. Thanks to Jennifer Rabb and for, to Jay Kriegel for organizing this. Joe Vitteridi left out one comparison uh, between Bill de Blasio and John Lindsay. During that first 1965 campaign, Jimmy Breslin asked whether John Lindsay was too tall to be mayor. Well, in a sense, uh, perhaps Lindsay paved the way for Bill de Blasio, who is even taller. 1965 all seemed possible. And no wonder that Joe chose Summer in the City as the title of his book. Summer in the City was when John Lindsay was at his best. Their history, as Joe wrote, has not been kind to Lindsay, but Joe writes that the current mayor should take a page from the book of John Lindsay. What I'd like to ask the panel is, which page? <laughs> Dick, let's start with you. Well, <clears throat> he shouldn't take the page of trying to borrow money to solve budget problems. But uh, I think he shares the same values that made John Lindsay a very exciting person at a very important time of change in our society and in the city. Uh, a recognition that uh, of the diversity of the population, of the enormity of the, the way wealth is distributed, of the enormous social and public needs, of using government as a instrument uh, to achieve greater equity in the society, uh, and as a result, maintain a degree of social equilibrium, uh, if one could achieve those goals. And I think that um, uh, I'm not an historian. I've lived through this all this period. I met John Lindsay when he was in Congress, when I, my first job was on the Hill in Washington, and I was very friendly with with John's first administrative assistant, Bob Lum. And um, I always had an immense uh, feeling of both affection and admiration for his energy, as I said, his values. And um, it, a combination of changing circumstances and events that uh, did not enable him to continue a, a political career uh, after his two terms. But it was an exciting eight years and a privilege to have benefited from it. Lillian? So I think it should definitely be the war and poverty page. Um, I think, um, you know, in the last so 18 years or so, we've had a war on the poor as opposed to the war on poverty. And I think it's, it's a great moment to try to reverse that and try to create a kinder city towards the poor and a city of opportunity. Yeah. But did that war on poverty work? Well, uh, I think it worked in some ways. I, don't, I think it, did, it failed uh, in many others. But I think it did bring awareness uh, about poverty and about the poor and about how children uh, were growing up in, without hope and, and in, in many instances in complete despair. One of the things that's so striking in Joe's book is that the poverty rate today is twice 
in New York City what it was back then. Yes, and I think the inequality is much worse. Um, I think, you know, when you think that 50% of, of the children in New York City are born in poverty, that's, that's a very scary number. Um, we're sheltering 52,200 people last night um, in the different shelters for the homeless. Um, you have, um, you know, you have a tremendous amount of, of not just poverty, but real despair and lack of hope. Uh, people who can't see where, where they can go. Uh, there's um, about close to 5,000 people living in the shelter that work full time. They work 35 hours a week and they cannot afford a rent. Now, that, that's something really wrong when that is happening. So I think that there's a lot of, it's a huge opportunity for us to try to reverse that and to try to build, uh, you know, not just a kinder city, kindness is a good word, but, but a city that really uh, has hope for everyone who wants to be part of it. Lindsay coming in at, as he did as a progressive Republican, uh, situating, positioning himself against traditional democratic politicians, um, saw that the working class was very much um, connected to that traditional democratic power and to the unions which represented it. And he really set himself up as instead speaking for the poor and the, uh, the minority populations in the city. And, and I think that in the, when we look back on it, there was really a, a, a lost opportunity had he articulated the extent to which those minority populations were struggling for many of the same reasons that working class ethnic populations were in a city that was undergoing deindustrialization in the late 60s and the early 70s, he could have built a broader base of support. So I think de Blasio understands this from what I read. I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I read the New York Times, so I do get some of my news from New York. I think he knows this, but um, I think he needs to keep an eye on that uh, tension. Vin, I don't want to back you into a corner. Your book was most critical or more critical of John Lindsay, but which page would you pick for Bill de Blasio? Yeah, Joe said that I'm, I'm supposed to be the critic here. He's given me carte blanche. So I would say three, three things. First of all, if you want government to work, if you want government to do things, if you want government to help the poor, then government has to work and people have to believe in the government. And I, I mean, I, I believe that by the end of Lindsay's second term, many, many New Yorkers stopped believing in government and that government could be an agent of change. Whether that was fair or not, that's uh, people have to decide. But people stop believing in government. Um, the second thing was sort of what Liz said, which is Lindsay was also a divisive figure. Um, that's part of his reform uh, persona. He was going to go after the power brokers. He was going to go after the people he thought were uh, doing injustice. And in doing that, I think he alienated not just unions, middle class, working class whites, uh, and others. Um, and I think in many ways, um, kind of help polarize the city, uh, which I think New York does not need today. And the third thing is what I don't think anyone's mentioned. Uh, in many ways, de Blasio will be judged on crime. If crime stays down, uh, and you know, I think de Blasio has a good chance of enacting some of his reforms. And, and choosing Bratton as his commissioner, I think he made a statement that he realized that crime is going to be the most, one of the most important issues. Dick? Uh, first of all, I, I don't think we should repeat the idea that John Lindsay was opposed by unions. It was the unions that played the major role in re-electing him mayor. For, first term, first term, yeah. Well, he got into a fight with Shanker because of the attempt at decentralization of the school system it was more, more Mac Bundy's fault than anyone else's in my view. Um, but- um, <clears throat> Poor Mac Bundy. And, uh, <laughs> but I think that, uh, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is there were fundamental changes taking place. We lost hundreds of thousands of private jobs during that period of time. That was not Lindsay's fault. It was an inevitable, inexorable demographic fact of our changing economy. And number two, we had a vast comparable increase in numbers at least with city employees, which was a function largely of the expanded social programs that came about as a result of the war on poverty. And that had to be met by a commensurate uh, increase in, in personnel delivering the services. Washington wrote the checks, local governments performed the services. Joyce Pernick of the Times uh, asked the question, what produced his record of failures, the leader or his times? Ben? 
Crime was probably the number one issue, and I think we're, we forget, and, and it's easy to forget today, how difficult it was. I mean, you're talking about a murder rate that increased during Lindsay's time two and a half times. No other city except for Detroit had an increase in murder rate that high. Um, you're talking about schools, problems in the schools. Uh, Lindsay was a great civil rights, he's a supporter of civil rights, but I would argue and that uh, New York was much more segregated by 1973 than it had been before. Uh, that's not Lindsay's fault necessarily, but that sort of complicates his, his role as a, um, as a civil rights leader. The city lost control of the subway system in 1966 to the MTA. The mayor lost control in 1969 of the Board of Education, um, which did not regain until around 2000. Uh, these were all serious setbacks, and that came out of the debacle of Ocean Hill-Brownsville. And then there was the second term, which Dick sort of talked about. You really have two Lindsay terms, where in the second term, the, the fiscal issues came to a head, and the city lost 250,000 jobs in, in four years. Could we have had a fiscal crisis without the complicity of lots of other public officials, from the governor the, to the controller? The, the, the list of, of, of people to blame is, is, is long. Uh, it includes Wagner, includes Beam, it includes Rockefeller, it includes the banks. That includes everyone, but it also includes uh, the man who was mayor for eight years. I would just, I would say that, that in many ways, Lindsay embodied the contradictions of the great society, that its successes and its failures. That successes, in fact, uh, were that government was doing things it hadn't done before. It was providing Medicare, Medicaid, there were jobs programs, there was Head Start. Um, you know, you can go on, legal aid, I mean, many uh, food stamps, many things that really did contribute to people's quality of life. On the negative side, and I think what leads to the, to the, to the failures are that there was not the infrastructure in place to fully support and fund those promises. So the expectations were raised hugely. And that to the extent that people became disillusioned, I think it's because their expectations had risen so much about what government could provide. And then the, the, you know, the, the Great Society was, was underfunded in many ways for what it ultimately uh, tried to deliver. Um, the, the resources, the city had, didn't have the resources to actually fund a lot of those programs. It was cities don't have the ability to enact their own taxes. They have to depend on the state. So there was that struggle um, going on. Um, and so I think, and then the Vietnam War came, which undercut even more the funding for the Great Society. So, you know, to the extent that, that it's a mixed tally, as I said, I think it's a mixed tally overall for the Great Society. And I, there are many historians who, for, for many years, said the Great Society was a huge failure. I don't think that's true at all. I think it, too, is both positive and negative. Let me just add something to Liz. We don't have a lot of public polling, but in 1972, Gallup took a poll of New Yorkers that said 60% thought that the city was not working for them. 45% thought that their neighborhoods were worse under Lindsay. And only about 15% thought that the, their neighborhoods were better. So we do have some evidence that people were losing faith in government. Second thing is the city was awash in revenues in the first term. It was an economic boom, economic boom on Wall Street. We had a city income tax. Uh, we had huge, uh, state and federal aid coming in. Um, this was not, I mean, after 69, the bottom falls out. But the first term, there was a lot of revenues coming to City Hall, a lot of needs as well. Um, I think the mayor knows that crime is indeed very important. And I think that's why Braddon was selected. And, and I think he knows he has to pay attention to that. He knows he has to be fiscally responsible. So it's a big challenge because, you know, you come in, you see all the need, and immediately you want to create programs that respond to the need. But it has to be within uh, budget responsibility. Um, and I think the overpromising issue is, is a huge one. Um, we have to be very careful what we promise and we need to deliver very quickly. One of the things that Lindsay was accused of doing and may well have is raising expectations beyond an ability to deliver. Uh, Murray Kempton said one does not mock the innocent and the brave, uh, but did Lindsay raise expectations beyond his capacity to deliver? I, think yeah. um, I don't think so. I think it's always important that you're Goals exceed your reach, uh, otherwise you're never going to change anything in society. And I think, uh, though, as has been suggested, the world changed uh, very dramatically and politically it changed. Uh, <clears throat> 
I, I have to also comment that he did not lose the subway system. He was thrilled when Nelson Rockefeller was prepared to take it over. Uh, and, um, but he, the, the fact of the matter is that you think about it, even though he and Nelson Rockefeller were both Republicans, it's no secret they didn't get along. They were highly competitive, uh, to say the least. Uh, but they had the same values. But then all of a sudden, uh, 1968, we, we elected a president who had values that were totally contrary to those of both the governor and the mayor of New York, and, and there was a very conservative reaction to the great society, to the uh, civil rights revolution, to all the social changes and demographic changes that had taken place. Um, and uh, Lindsay was sort of, a, um, in some ways, a fish out of water. I just want to just emphasize the point you just made, Dick, and that I had alluded to earlier, that we can't, I don't think, talk about any mayor without being very conscious of the structure, the economic structure of municipalities in our system. That they, are, they carry so much of the responsibility to provide services, and yet they don't have the ability to actually make crucial decisions about uh, resources about uh, the income right. that they're going to get through taxation. Um, so it's a very difficult position to be in. Lindsay, uh, long before Giuliani, was considered America's mayor. He was a poster boy for uh, the urban movement, the urban crisis. Whatever happened to the urban crisis? So we just went through a presidential campaign in which urban America, in which cities were barely mentioned. Uh, have they been overlooked? Have they been slighted? Or have urban problems become so universal that they no longer are treated separately as urban problems? Well, first of all, over 90% of the population in the United States lives in cities. So it's hard to define what you mean by an urban problem uh, from any other kind of problem in society. Second of all, I think the phrase urban problem, and we, we went through a phase, we had schools of urban affairs, we gave degrees at universities in urban affairs, but it was really because people didn't want to talk honestly about race. It was a, a, a way of talking about race without talking about race per se. Uh, so, um, uh, we, have, we have always had a, a challenge uh, for providing housing for the poor because the amount of subsidy required is so, uh, so profoundly high. And we are, lived through a period then, and I, unfortunately we're living through it now, where uh, there is little support for the kinds of tax revenues that would be necessary if one uh, wanted to provide the kind of subsidies that are necessary. Uh, Health care is a subject unto itself. And uh, um, I think that uh, the basic city services uh, of New York have always been pretty damn good because despite the, the, the fluctuations that have been described accurately over time, it's still a place that people from all over the world want to come to to, to live. Uh, and still a beacon for uh, people all over the, this country as well as, as well as the world. And uh, I remember when I paid for my first co-op apartment in 1965, and I know what it's worth today. So I don't think we got a hell of a lot to complain about. <laughs> Anyone else want to weigh in? You know, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that uh, most of the people who left for, for suburbia in the 60s came back in a hurry after a while, uh, just because the, well, New York was where it was at. I mean, I, I think they, they were profoundly bored elsewhere. Um, I, I'm sounding like Ed Koch, right? <laughs> um, whom I loved and worked for. Um, but I, you know, I do think that urban problems are very different today than they were then. I think we've learned um, to govern cities differently and probably better. And I think um, you know, the, the, what was seen as intractable uh, became doable, and at least in people's minds. Uh, I think that New York for a long time was seen as something ungovernable and something that couldn't happen. 
And you know, it's been pretty good in the last uh, many years. So I think it's, it's a, just a different dialogue that has to happen. I think inequality is the real problem we're facing now that we have profound inequality that is not going to get better automatically. We have to be affirmative about what changes we have to make. And I don't want to sound like Pollyanna, but a city where only the rich people and people who have means have everything and a lot of people have nothing or very little, it's not a good city. It's not a livable city. It's not a place that it's going to be harmonious in the long run. So I think it's you know, it's, it's something we need to address. Vin, but we talked in 1965 about a city that was ungovernable, about a job that was the second toughest job in America, about a city that was run by the power brokers. What changed? In 65, you mean? Since then. Oh, since 1965, a lot's changed. I mean, this is a city now today. Today, New York 2014 looks a lot more like New York 1914. We've got 40% of New Yorkers are foreign born. When I mean, you talk about income inequality, a lot of this has to do with the fact that we have lots of new Americans, immigrants who are often at the bottom of the, the income scale. And they come here, as Dick said, because they might be at the bottom, they might have very little, but they think that this is a place for them. Um, that's changed. New York in 1965 had different kinds of migrants, uh, blacks from the South and Puerto Ricans, but it was very different. Um, and population now, we've gained, what, 1.2 million people from the bottom, which was around 1980. I think we lost about a million, gained about a million two. Um, it's a new, it's a, crime is down, it looks different, we have gentrification, changing neighborhoods for good, and also there's problematic aspects of gentrification as well. Um, this is in many ways a very different, uh, different city, but it's also a city which is uh, is, has income inequality, and I think or you talk about urban issues, uh, you know, urban income inequality is a national issue. Well, I think you could argue that we actually do have an urban crisis today, and it would relate to this, this point about the great inequality. There are a lot of people living in poverty in a city like New York and in most other cities, a lot of homeless people, but it's not doing work for politicians to label it that way, as it did for Lyndon Johnson, the Kerner Commission, John Lindsay. When they said urban crisis, that meant there would be resources coming from the federal government as a result of doing that. Today, in the sort of neoliberal world we live in, um, it's actually going to be self-defeating to talk about an urban crisis, because you want investment, you want private sector commitment to the city, so it, it really isn't helpful to give it that label. Okay, poverty in 1959 in New York was about 16.2 percent. These are census bureau numbers, not... Uh, in 1969, it was 14.2 percent, which is, again, after a long economic boom. Uh, it's unfair to talk about unemployment today because we're still fighting through a recession, but if you look at, un uh, I'm sorry, poverty rates just before the recession, the, the, the Census Bureau was 16.8. The city has its own numbers, which are slightly higher, about two percentage points higher. In that sense, you know, we're not talking about a vast difference in, in poverty. Yes, there are lots of poor people, but there were lots of poor people in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s as well. But it's very cyclical. Of course, when you get, you know, recessions, when Wall Street goes down, it really hits those at the bottom. But I, so I just take a little bit of, you know, in terms of the poverty rates here. It's well, we have a slightly higher poverty rate. We have a higher a lot more immigrant. We have a higher lot more unemployment immigrant. rate. We have 50,000 record number the, of homeless the, people. The unemployment rate in January of, of, of 2014 in New York City was 7.8 percent. Are, are we better off today than we were then? Well, it depends how. Then when? Then the 60s. Then John Lindsay's. I would say era. yes. Liz. Well, I do think that, and here's where I would say the Great Society's legacy has some very positive sides. I think we have more of a safety net as a result of Great Society programs um, with food stamps, um, with um, uh, Medicare, with Medicaid, with many of the, even though there's been a kind of whittling away and um, undermining of a lot of, the, of these uh, social programs, we still have um, a substantial safety net that makes people, poor people's lives better today, I think, than they were in the early 1960s. Lou? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree that, that definitely there's many programs that provide a safety net for the poor, but we've also seen in the last probably 18 years a lot of very punitive regulations uh, to obtain those safety net programs. 
so that it's been a real struggle for people to not only have access to them, but to stay with them. So there's a lot of churning that happens in the welfare caseload. There's a lot of churning with food stamps. Uh, you know, it's a con constant struggle to get whatever entitlements you're entitled to get. Ben, don't take this personally, but does the rest of the panel agree that history has been very unkind to John Lindsay? Uh, I don't think Joe Vitteretti does, and I, we're talking about a, a terrific book that he put together, and I think it's a very fair and balanced and favorable description of John Lindsay's service as mayor. There's no perfect mayor. I've worked for four of them. <laughs> uh, but he was Which was the most perfect one? Um. Don't ask her. Don't. You don't have to answer that. <laughs> Okay, we'll get you off the hook. <laughs> when, when I um, actually read through the, the, the full book, not just my own essay for, uh, in preparation for today, um, it was a kind of deep dive into the era again of, of John Lindsay, and I was so struck by how creative, imaginative, experimental, I mean, it's a kind of um, a quality that we don't really think about public officials um, engaging with today. And so, you know, so to say, you know, what's the reputation? I don't know that we even use the same measurements. Um, I was just very struck by the... Um, but arguably, we saw a lot of that in the Bloomberg administration, certainly, right? Yeah, um, it's true, but it was that was very much um, strategies that have worked in the private sector, a, a corporate corporate rule book that we can apply to the public sector. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, a certain kind of creativity. But I think there was a real rethinking: what can government do, and how can we accomplish it? Um, what can it not do, and what do we really? And Lindsay did recognize that government couldn't do it all and that the private sector was desperately needed. And he did, in, my essay is on economic development. There really was an effort to try to get investment in the city, to keep jobs, to create new jobs. He recognized that. Um, but I think today we are so in, um, we feel so vulnerable to the whims and agenda of the private sector that there's just a, a, such an effort to, um, to win that approval and not think about what government could do. There's that fear that it will be just viewed as liberalism with the big L if you even think about what government should accomplish and that the private sector cannot. John Lindsay got elected mayor in 1965 uh, in no small part because of a, a momentum of publicity uh, in newspapers, all of whom chose to take all of the economic and demographic facts that were happening in the city without regard to who was mayor and blaming it on Wagner and on the Democrats. And uh, there was a crusade on the part of the major newspapers um, to elect John Lindsay. And it was understandable. He was indeed uh, uh, an exciting personality with all the right values, etc. Uh, but I, I mention that not in any way to demean Lindsay, but to point out that, that the way a mayor is characterized is as much to do with um, how he performs in reality. If you really want to measure how a mayor performs, you have to look uh, in part at the people he has around him. Lindsay had uh, people around him who were able thoughtful, bright, on the merits. I, I'm not, to the best of my recollection, and I was not in government, but I was very involved with it. I don't remember as ever appointing somebody for the wrong reason to government, just because they And I, I uh, think a lot of the leadership for many years came from the Lindsay administration. Yeah, in that's fact, right. one of the great legacies of that administration is the people he appointed. And one of the remarkable things is the people I see here tonight many of whom are alumni of the administration, how little everyone has changed. <laughs> uh, Sam me, can say that because we can't see any of you. I know. <laughs> Just a quick question to anyone who wants to answer it on the panel. We can easily second guess the Lindsay administration, but if you had been working for it uh, back then, is there anything you would have done differently? with benefit of hindsight? Um, 
I'm not sure there is. I, I would not have uh, I would not have followed the Ford Foundation's lead in uh, school decentralization, but um, uh, I think that um, most of what he did is what it, any other honorable, decent person would have done if they had the job at the time. Lou? I, I agree. I think I would have totally been caught in the idealism of the administration. It, it's, uh, I, I, I have complete philosophical agreement with what he was trying to do. So it would have been very difficult to sort of, you know, in retrospect, you can think, oh, well, you know, it would have been different. But, you know, he did extraordinary stuff on child care. He did all kinds of things uh, in terms of jobs. You know, it, it was really pretty remarkable. Liz? I think I would go back to the point I started off with. Um, and it's, a, it's not, some, it's not a, a criticism um, only of Lindsay. It's really of the, the, what happened with the, to the Democratic Party, that it didn't find a way of being more inclusive enough to set an agenda that was um, found the commonality between racial groups and ethnic groups and working class groups so that in fact there was a coalition. If you look at the next presidential election was 72 and look what happened with McGovern. Um, so you know, they're, they're, I think that the, the, the tragedy of Lindsay is a, is a deeper one. Then? I agree with Jack. Ocean Hill Brownsville was something. Although I think Lindsay was much more involved in it than just than you, than you put in, put in there. Um, in schools, I mean, you know, you look at it's unfair to say he should have done things like charter schools, but you know, more thinking about uh, education. I mean, education. You want to talk about poverty and inequality. One of the biggest things you can do about. Um, erasing those issues is education. And you know, apart from this uh, vague idea of decentralization, which in some ways was good, this was a, a sort of a stodgy bureaucracy. Uh, after that, uh, you know, I, I think they, they basically said hands off to education. Um, and more thinking about crime, I think. That was, uh, that was I think, a big, big problem. Uh, and it's not that just that they didn't do anything about crime, but they didn't give the New Yorkers a sense that something was being done. Somewhere in the city, the legacy of John Lindsay. Thanks so much to our panel, and thanks to all of you. I guessed wrong on the weather before the city's biggest snowfall last winter, and that was a mistake. But I put 6,000 more cops on the streets, and that was no mistake. The school strike went on too long, and we all made some mistakes. But I brought 225,000 new jobs to this town. And that was no mistake. And I fought for three years to put a fourth police platoon on the streets. And that was no mistake. And I reduced the deadliest gas in the air by 50%. And I forced the landlords to roll back unfair rents. And we did not have a Detroit, a Watts, or a Newark in this city. And those were no mistakes. The things that go wrong are what make this the second toughest job in America. But the things that go right are what make me want it. Good to be here. Um, let me just say, I, when, when Jay Kriegel asked me to do this, I had to say yes. Um, but uh, he didn't tell me that I was going to be the youngest person by a number of years. Um, I, I, for perspective, I can tell you that um, I met Mayor Lindsay when I was about five years old. <laughs> and um, I was living at the time, and this does say something I think about uh, the successes of the administration and of that time. I was living in the, um, the Manhattanville houses, housing projects in uh, West Harlem. My father was uh, a, uh, at the time, I guess he would have been a sergeant in the NYPD. Um, went to Head Start, played in the parks, and you know, the, the different programs that were out there, the different things that were available to us were just sort of part of growing up. And I always saw that as a, a, a straight line between those programs and those possibilities and where my sisters and I all ended up. So I mean, I, I, I think of the Lindsay administration as sort of the, the ground upon which I, I mean, literally was, was born and the things that were going on. Um, I do think also, though, that there has been this sort of history that's been put over it. And so when I read about times that I vaguely remember as a child, I think to myself, it couldn't have been like that. But uh, I guess you all are here to help set that record straight. Um, you know, we were called the Kitty Corps back then, and so I think a lot of people thought we were five, too, Harold. 
I met him at a parade, and he, you know, he said, what's your name, young man? I said, you know my name. I know yours. Um, making up a journalist. Uh, I, I got better at, at answering questions. Um, so so, so I, I want to hear from each of you um, whether, you know, how it felt to be in there every day. And I want to start with day one. Did you see the transit strike coming? Was it uh, a, a storm that kind of overwhelmed everything else, or did you kind of come in on a war footing and assume that, well, we're going to have some problems and, and this could be one of them? It was coming. We couldn't have stopped it. Um, uh, after John Lindsay uh, won, uh, Robert Wagner disappeared, the administration disappeared. Uh, those people who should have been, uh, who should have left, didn't want to leave because they wanted to stay in their office, but we tried to make them leave. Uh, as we got to the union negotiation, there was really very little structure within the Lindsay administration organization to deal with what had to be dealt with. And he was clear that he wasn't going to give what they were asking. I also think it was clear that Quill, who was then head of the Transport Workers Union, needed to strike. He needed to establish his leadership. And this was going to be a strike no matter what we did in that situation. And so Were it, we prepared for it? That's another question. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that we could have done anything differently than what he did to get to the point. That's when we look back on, and we've discussed this among ourselves, we look back on a lot of different things we might have done differently. But this is one that was inevitable, and I'm not sure we could have been better prepared. Mm. Folks, talk a little bit about what it was like to work with John Lindsay. What kind of a, what kind of a boss was he? I joined it in the second administration. Mm -hmm. I, in the first time, in the first election, I went with Robert Kennedy while he campaigned for Abe Beam. You know? And it was, because uh, I was the only Democrat at City Hall when I joined it after that. Um, Bobby Kennedy said, do you know anybody who has charisma other than John Lindsay? To me one day after we went to a rally. So it was that competition between the two of them at the time. Um, when I joined, I joined the campaign. I met Jay during the um, school strike. Uh, Jack Newfield used to bring him up to the house all the time to talk about what, he, what was going on, what do people think. And then my friend Barry Goddard asked me to come in at, after Lindsay lost the Republican primary and um, Procaccino won the Democratic primary, and I organized the Democrats for Lindsay. And I never met Mayor Lindsay. You know, I had went to work in the campaign. And part of it, it's interesting because we talked about the political background and the demise of the Democrat or the, the, the problems of the Democratic Party. It was also at the height of the reform movement. I mean, we had just really made major defeats in the leadership of the, of the Democratic Party, in, in, especially in Manhattan, but partly in the city. So that when Lindsay ran in 65, he got a lot of dissident Democrats supporting him. I, being a district leader and loyal to the senator, I was in a funny spot. So I, um, Dick Aurelio asked me if I'd like to join the administration, and I was home, housewife with three kids and a husband. And, uh, <laughs> I thought, I'm going to go back to work. It was great. How much do I want? What, what title do I want? I had no idea. But I went over to City Hall, and not to City Hall, to Gracie Mansion, and I met the mayor, and he asked me what I thought, and I said what I'd like, because I also talked to other people before I went, and I went to work, and I loved it. I was the oldest member of the staff, aside from the deputy mayor. I'm still the oldest member, right? And the only Democrat. <laughs> and um, it was a glorious job. And I loved every minute of it. I thought the mayor was astonishing. He was um, what Sam really said earlier. Um, he, and we all really did believe we could change the world. First of all, he was serious. He was serious about the job of government. He cared about it. He worked at it. If he didn't understand something, he either tried to learn it or he tried to figure out who he could trust on it. If you got into trouble, he backed you. Not unthinkingly, not blindly. But this guy had the knack of amplifying you, whereas many bosses in public life restrain you. They're living in fear you're going to go around the next corner too fast. He would kick people sometimes to go around the next corner faster. And he had both. That's very, very rare. Third of all, he understood, as he and Fred Hayes used to talk with each other, it doesn't take 30 good people to run New York City or 300, it takes 3,000. And as I think was mentioned in the earlier panel, the whole next generations of New York City and New York State leadership came out of that administration. It used to drive Ed Koch nuts when people would point out to him how many of his really good appointments came from Lindsay Land, if I can use that frame. Well, I would add to all that that uh, it was exciting. Um, he was a great boss for a young person. 
uh, particularly emphasizing what Peter said, his willingness to let you make mistakes and back you doing that and basically saying, first time I thought I did something horrible, walked into his office and uh, was scared to death I'd be fired. He, he put his glasses up, he roared and he said, go back and do it again and again and again until you get it right. And it was just a wonderful message for someone of five or 25. Uh, but I think also that, that John Lindsay, uh, and you don't hear any of this in, in, in these uh, the panels of historians, John, John Lindsay had uh, a clarity of vision uh, and a, a fierce set of principles that, that let you know what he really believed in and where he was going. And, and it was extraordinary to work for someone who was that clear about the direction he wanted to take the city in. Um, I just remember in the 65 campaign, uh, when I was a young director of research, we started getting all these letters about the Vietnam War. There were only two elected officials who'd come out against the war in the United States at that point. And Lindsay in 65 was going around New York City talking about the war. And I said to him one night, why are you talking about the war? You're running for mayor. It's just getting people angry. And he said, I'll talk about whatever I want to. Don't tell me what I should, <laughs> what I should believe or talk about. You do your job. Well, well, we'll, we'll say a little more about that. I mean, it was, was this um, a, a vision that he felt he was developing with you know, with millions of New Yorkers, or was this sort of personal beliefs that he wanted to put out there regardless of the political consequences? Well, listen, the fundamental vision and principle, of course, was to open up uh, a government and the institutions that support it, which he thought were closed, to a whole group of people who were the, the new outsiders. Uh, primarily, it was primarily racial then, it was blacks and Hispanics. Uh, and. Um, he didn't need reinforcement. He saw, saw it everywhere. Of course, uh, as a, a, a Cabot Surf's essay makes clear, and as was mentioned earlier, a Republican who came out of the Congress, who saw, saw the, the Jim Eastlands and the Richard Russells blocking civil rights legislation, felt very comfortable, and, and who saw Tammany Hall in New York, felt very comfortable believing that, that the Lincoln Republican and Roosevelt, um, Teddy Roosevelt Republican Party was much more progressive. He was not in, at all embarrassed about being a Republican fighting, fighting for civil rights and for, for progressive values. But I think those, those values, which were really what that administration was about, and you know, when I, when I hear the question asked by, by Sam, what would you do differently, you know, on the fundamental issues, I would do nothing differently. On the fundamental issues, John Lindsay was right. History has proven him right. He took this city through an extraordinary transition that all his successes could build on. Sam Roberts uh, has a, a fabulous sentence in his book about Lindsay in which he said that, um, you know, if John Lindsay hadn't held the city together and hadn't opened the city up to new people, what would there have been for Ed Koch, uh, Rudy Giuliani, and Mike Bloomberg to build on? And I believe that's profoundly important. If I can, for, since you asked a question about working for John Lindsay, I, 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 I think of a story of John that, that probably explains this mayor to me as an individual. He taught me a lot, you know, he taught me not to believe my own press releases. I mean, we had a lot of conversations about different things. But I remember a, a night early on um, in, in an East New York Canarsie area where um, uh, we were going to speak at a school, uh, and it was multiracial. It, it, it wasn't e either the, the full side of Canarsie or East New York. Um, and it was a demonstration within that school that wouldn't let John speak and let the mayor speak about. Um, and the demonstration was of parents because a kid had been killed by a speeding car near a school. And it was the third or fourth instance, and it had, been no, it had fallen on deaf ears. And it became so bad, the mayor couldn't speak. We, we had to get him out the back door. We pulled a limousine in the front. In those days, a limousine. Pulled in the front. That's where everybody went to complain more and with their packets, and we took them out the side, and I'm driving them in the car uh, back to, uh, to Gracie Mansion, and I'm living. I'm trying to figure, how are we gonna get even? This? I mean, how, what disrespect they can have for the mayor of the city of New York, uh, and, I'm, and I'm steaming, and he says, Sid, tomorrow you get on this. They're that angry, there must be a reason. And that was John Lindsay. He, it wasn't, it was, he, he grasped the situation differently than the rest of us saw it. He wanted to solve the problem. He, he, the, the, the time was so different also. I think what, from my, my point of view, the communities were so much more active. So you had this time that he's the mayor where you've got people marching across the bridge. You've got the, 
the, the building, the construction workers, you know, coming into City Hall to lower the flag. You've got the gays out there after Stonewall. You've got the women who want to change um, all the alimony laws. You've got the poor who are living in shelters. You've got all these SROs and welfare hotels. We had them then, and we didn't really have an agency yet. But, and you've got, of course, all the, the people who needed help. And, um, but those people, if the, the difference also was in the population. The, they were out there to make their demands. You know, Giuliani rode roughshod over them. He had the sharpshooters up on the roof when somebody came. And Bloomberg had phoned them all, so there was no resistance because they were afraid they were gonna lose their voice. But what happened was the Lindsay administration was so much more responsive, I think, to the needs of the city. It was a people's government. And well, I don't think we've had that since. Well, let me ask you, I mean, it, it seems that um, the, the, the goal of maximum feasible participation was really sort of pushed to the limit in a lot of cases in a way that, as you suggest, we haven't seen since in, in other administrations. Was there ever a point um, where you might have said to one another, hey, you know what, we, you know, we're, we're, we're getting rolled here or things are spinning out of our control, we need to do this a little bit differently? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta remember what we had. We had Abby Hoffman, with the yippies. Whenever he felt like it at two o'clock in the morning, he would take a soapbox out on, on A Street and St. Mark's Place and stop traffic uh, and start talking, you know, and, and uh, uh, with his megaphone and then go back and get stoned. Uh, so uh, you, you, you have the young lords, you had, you had they say, uh, Sonny Carson taken over the anti poverty office in, in, in uh, Crown Heights, and on and on. You had Columbia. This was a time when people voiced their the differences with government, let's say, in a very uh, extreme way. Uh, so going to sleep every night, which is about maybe four in the morning and getting up at six to see what you did wrong that day and what was about to happen the next day, uh, and, and, and having the mayor say, get up to Lincoln Hospital, because commissioner tells me they took it over again. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it, 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 did, did we, uh, there were times when you started really scratching your head as, as to what was real and what was not real. We have now the mayor's management report, which has got, you know, a thousand different metrics and, you know, immaculately presented in PowerPoints and so forth. Of course, the, the backbone of the information, you know, technology wasn't even available, but what, what were you trying to measure on a day-to-day -day basis? What was, you know, as, assuming there wasn't some, some big burning emergency that was going to swamp everything else, what were you trying to measure? How were you trying to gauge your success? I'm going to get there, Errol, I'm going to get there with one quick detour that I want all of us to get. One of the most remarkable things about this government and this man who led it was that they excelled in two dimensions. The first dimension, we've heard about the stress, opening up the city to minorities who had not been represented, violence, threat of wackiness. This was a city that didn't have any riots, remember? In that dimension, public commitment to values, understanding what the battle about race in this country was all about and the battle about poverty. And on a totally different dimension, this man built the strongest, most outstanding bank of talent, analytic, and management capacity of any city in the country. Either one alone is a great accomplishment. Both is really amazing. So what was it like in the part of the government I ran? It was like coming in and trying to clean out a stable full of crap old bodies, corruption. I'm only exaggerating a little. The city had had no, the last strong generation of city management had been the depression generation. Most of them were 50 or 60 when we got there. And one of the things we had to slow, almost as in combat, hill by hill, department by department, we had to put people in, focus them, decide, as you say, what we were going to measure. I remember the uproar in the police department, the first budget, not Lindsay, this is the first budget, this is the budget we put out that uh, came out in July, June, July 67. So it would have been gone over with the mayor. 60, second, budget. Sec, second budget. Thank you, Jay. We decided we are going to measure something called effective patrol units in the police department. Not an advanced comment, ladies and gentlemen, concept. How many police units are on the street given the expenditure? How much does he, the police department went nuts? <laughs> You went, absolutely, you're gonna measure what? How many police patrol units? Just take that department by department. Health, nightmare. Lindsay administration did open up the police department. I would say they made a crack in the fire department. That was tough. Other areas you go down, it was like 
It was like teaching an unruly, lazy, old government from scratch. Did he have efficiency experts or professors whispering in his ear? Where, where was the, the motivation coming from for that? I, I don't think that's quite the word for it. <laughs> we had a director of the budget who was a genius. His name was Fred Hayes, and he had narcolepsy. And he smoked. And when he fell asleep and smoked in meetings, the room, including Lindsay, just, you know, looking like this. I remember one long meeting, Fred falls asleep, and uh, it's on housing, and Jay Nathan is there, he's pontificating, sorry, he's the housing administrator, you don't know these names. Anyway, Jay's going on, everybody's arguing, and Fred's fallen asleep during the meeting. The meeting's over, he wakes up, and Lindsay decides to pull his chain, and he turns to me and says, Fred, would you sum up? <laughs> and Hayes sums up perfectly. <laughs> Another guy and I walk out with him, okay, Fred, what the hell, how did you do that? He says, every housing discussion always covers the same issues. <laughs> one of the, along the same lines, um, there's a lot that's been written in one of the, the legacies of the administration of the community boards, the community planning districts and, you know, coterminality and trying to sort of move everything down to uh, to that level. Was that seen as an efficiency measure or, you know, a sort of a, a service delivery model or was it also about politics and about trying to sort of um, break the back of, uh, of some of the local machines out in the neighborhoods? The summer of 66 was really seminal. The first uh, neighborhood disturbance occurred in East New York in July of, of 66. Uh, East New York is a long way from City Hall and uh, Sid, myself, Barry, uh, ran out the first night and basically spent a month out there and ended up the first neighborhood City Hall. But one of the things we found out, there was no way from City Hall that you could find out anything about what was going on in East New York on a day-to-day -day basis. City Hall knew nothing about the communities in New York. Why? Because it was very simple. This, the city had the democratic organization. So the, the information system for New York City was the clubhouses around the city. You wanted a street light? You wanted your garbage picked up differently, you went to your district leader. So, so uh, it wasn't so much forming a different political system, but creating something that could make the government responsive locally and simultaneously figure out how you could give the local sanitation man, the local cop, the local parks person some real power to get things done. So, so uh, that was the real challenge. I think, you know, Sid is, and Ronnie have both described some of the the craziness of the streets, and, and I do think what is missing from so many of the books, and you really have to, have to watch videos to get a sense of what the country was like in the 60s. Uh, it, anybody who walks into City Hall in any decade since then has no idea what it would really be like to have that kind of turmoil. And the, 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 Ronnie, Ronnie said it best, I think, given what was going on out there, um, with all due respect to, to Vincent Canato, I defy anybody to have tried to control the city in that era. And Lindsay's approach was really to open the doors and to deal with people and to try to work things out because those forces on the street that pent up uh, fury and rage uh, and energy was just uncontrollable. And it really started in East New York because in the first weekend, not knowing what to do, um, there, there was, this was a battle between uh, whites and blacks, Italian kids and black kids over a piece of turf, a classic turf battle, a literal piece of land in East New York. And Lindsay decided to invite all of the community leaders to City Hall. In fact, that was really in many ways the beginning, a precursor of that only being Lindsay's entire campaign was going around the city and walking everywhere and being with the people. See, so. It's this odd thing about this this uh, this um, patrician wasp, very tall, not quite as tall as the mayor now, but very tall, but who was much more responsive and open to what was going on in every neighborhood for an odd combination of reasons than I think any mayor we've had since then. The um, it was also the time of the welfare rights organization and George Wiley and all the welfare recipients, and they camped out. Do you remember this? They camped out in City Hall Park. And then they were going to have a, a thing they wanted to give the mayor their list of demands. And these guys all, I don't know, somehow it got dumped on me. 
remember. Reasonable. I, I remember Jeffrey Katzenberg was coming. He came to get me at a certain place. He had put me when it was time for me to go to the head of the steps. Well, welfare to receive rights the was demands. on your was under you. Right. So there's George Wiley, <laughs> whose daughter, incidentally, I think, is now working for She's the for, for, the for De Blasio. Exactly right. Well, he was great, and he comes up walking up the, the stairs, and I'm at the head of the stairs, and all the local television crews are there waiting and they had waited too long and they were impatient, they wanted to make the six o'clock news. Anyway, he had his, his afro and his dashiki on and he walks up and first he hugs me because we're friends and then he steps back and reads the list of demands about all the kids that are dying from lead poisoning and starving and this and that and everything else and I took them and I don't know what I said but I, I took the list and I said we would be back to them and I went downstairs to my office and three minutes later this young man comes to the office and he said, Mrs. Eldridge, could I have that list of demands? We gave you our only copy. <laughs> And it was on the six o'clock news. I mean, it was the big news of the day. Yeah, we did not have the political organization that we could get the kinds of things that we should be getting from the communities. So the Little, cities hall, little City Halls became our, our outreach. Uh, our task force uh, uh, in the local communities became our outreach. And later on, um, the community boards became it. They were the ones who fed back to us. And a lot of the things were small problems that could be dealt with. A lot of it had to do with, you know, in housing and education, just like today. But in a lot of things, it was the frustration of not even being able to get a, a, a hoop fixed on a basketball, uh, uh, you know, rim because there was no one to do it, or a water fountain working, or a park bench, or cleaning up a, a little park that was overrun with rats. And it was that the kind we could respond to that, having the information. And that was a. A key thing, you know, John Lindsay walking in Harlem in 1968 after Martin Luther King, when, when this city didn't burn and we looked across the river and, and we saw the fires, wasn't about that uh, that night, it was about three years or two years leading to the, that night that he could walk down the street and had the people's respect that he was there because he cared. It was not the first time he was on 125th Street. It was not the 10th time. It probably was the 50th time. He was there. They'd seen him. He cared. And he came up to be with them. To, to what extent were you, um, not just when it came to things like civil unrest, but you know, sort of looking at the other cities, looking at Daly in Chicago and Rizzo in Philadelphia, whoever, um, and, and uh, comparing yourselves to them? That's that was, Jay. That was you. Well, I, you know, this, this was a period when there was one leader of the cities of America, was John Lindsay. Uh, the, the, the one outlier probably was Dick Daly in Chicago. I spent um, a lot of effort, I don't I actually in retrospect, not sure why, maybe almost a personal <laughs> quest, getting Lindsay and Daly together in a meeting uh, with Daly's chief staff. And, that meeting lasted less than three minutes. <laughs> uh, Lin we got, got together in the meeting room in Washington, Daly came in, Lindsay said a few things, and Daly just <laughs> effectively said, fuck you, but he just said, uh, <laughs> I got up and walked out, and it was stunning. Stun 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 it was two people, couldn't have two people further apart, but, but I think my favorite Lindsay Daly episode was in 68 after Martin Luther King uh, his death when, when Chicago was having terrible troubles and they um, didn't have today's communication, but the, across the ticker came a, a story that Mayor Daley had issued a shoot to kill order in Chicago. And, um, you know, we ran in and talked to the mayor and, and uh, about two minutes later, John Lindsay issued a statement in New York City saying, we don't shoot children in New York City. And to me, that's probably the proudest moment of eight years. I think Lindsay's, um, <laughs> despite all the anxieties and all the fear and everything that's going on in the middle class, and there's, there's no way to, to not to bridge that gap, Lindsay understood exactly what, what government should do, exactly what the role of the police and the use of deadly force was, and never wavered on that for eight years, no matter what the pressure was. And, and, I think the feeling of pride that you can take 40 years later is really a wonderful thing to carry with you. You know, he talked about Saturday night specials, especially when he was running and especially in the Florida primary, right? Saturday night specials, the, the cheap guns that were coming in. I mean, I, I, that was, that, he was really out on that issue and that was a, a very unpopular stance and of course it didn't help with his chances.
here's what, what I'm, that I've been wondering about is, um, Nixon gets elected in 1968. Um, the f at, at a practical level, the flow of federal That's funds Nixon, is, yeah. is, 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 is greatly disrupted in the second term. Um, the hard hat riot in 1970. Did you have a sense that, you know, show's over, the mood, the mood of the country is changing, um, that this effort, this presidential effort to sort of move the Lindsay administration onto the national stage in that way uh, was maybe out of sync with where the country was going? I, I, yeah, from, I think uh, from John Lindsay's point of view, I think he's, you know, he felt that way. That's why he ran. I, I, I don't think that John Lindsay, and I have a reason to believe, uh, that John Lindsay ran to, believing that he'd win the, the Democratic presidential nomination in 1972. He ran to again put the urban areas, the cities, on the focus of what should be happening in this, in this country because we, they were being forgotten. It was being shoved back. And he was the conscience of the city. Uh, when you think of, this, this is a, America's man, you talk, taking from Giuliani, I guess, well, America's man was at that time certainly John Lindsay from the media's point of view, the most recognizable mayor in the world, uh, actually. So he understood when he was running what was happening um, and he needed that. He needed to state that out. And we talked about those issues. I mean, I remember talking about the difference why the federal government isn't doing the welfare payments, why people are coming from Mississippi to New York because of the difference in the money that they that could be get. I mean, those were issues that were discussed in that campaign. It wasn't uh, just, it wasn't a personality kind of thing at all, I don't think. And people actually liked him. I was in California. And they loved They him. didn't vote for him. They liked him. They didn't have a chance. No, wait a minute. They didn't well, have a Florida, chance. Florida, they loved him. <laughs> the gays especially liked him in California because they knew of his record here. Interesting. And that was, in, that was you know, in the 70s. Anyway. I can't help saying, saying that uh, uh, it's probably two years ago I walked out of theater seeing Normal Heart and woke Ronnie up to say that uh, watching that play about the AIDS epidemic in the Koch era and, and what was going on in the city government uh, made me uh, feel an incredible sense of respect for her that when we were all very far behind her in the early 70s, she opened up City Hall to the Mattachine Society, gays who were... were the Gay were, Liberation were, Alliance. Were, all whatever. these characters. Gay Alliance. And, and, uh, <laughs> and led to Lindsay issuing the executive order. And I think without Ronnie, none of that would have happened. She really has clairvoyance. <laughs> Okay. You know, I would, the accolade. That's okay. Thank you. I was, <laughs> all right, I won't talk. <laughs> she's, if she's also a kvetch and a nudge. They, and all, she, yeah, she, they always make fun of me. Let me tell you, <laughs> no one has ever driven me crazy in my life right. than Ronnie about lead gonna, poisoning, yeah, 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 a list of issues. I was going to say, as soon as they saw me, they all wanted to go away. <laughs> but that was, it was interesting from a woman's point of view because I came from being a housewife. I mean, I was a Democratic district leader. I was active in the, in, in the Democratic in the reform movement. But I had three kids. I had a husband. I brought common sense. You know, here I had all these young hotshots. And it was such an important moment, I think, for realizing the talents that women have. I want to tell one other story, because we have a member of the audience who, had, who participated in a funny kind of way. Uh, I had the task force. They gave me Greenwich Village. And I go to my first meeting, and then somebody gets up and says, you know, Young lady, what are we going to hear from you? Your predecessor's in jail. It was Jim Marcus, and he had been the result. So they started screaming about me that this was a corrupt thing. Anyway, the village. So I knew then, I learned about SROs, the welfare hotels, um, all different kinds of problems just from that place. And one of the hotels is now a condominium on Bleecker Street called the Atrium. But at that time, it was called the Broadway, wasn't the Broadway Central, it was something Central else. Central Plaza. No, it wasn't that either. But anyway, it was a, ho a hotel built as a, as a shelter for indigent men in the late 1800s. So it had a big atrium, and around it ran all these rooms that were just hard chicken wire up to about here and then open, you know, or whatever. And we um, organized a tenants committee there. We had a social service unit there. We had St. Vincent had a health unit outside. We also gave out the welfare checks outside because we thought the landlord, the owner, was corrupt. So anyway, we organized a tenants committee. And one day, the social worker calls and says, you know, the president of the tenants committee didn't show up, and I'm worried about him. Um, we think he may have been arrested. So I called uh, Bill Vanden Heuvel, who was then the chair of the Board of Corrections. And he sent a young lawyer named Mr. Cherry, 
I called the superintendent or the head of the tombs, and I said that Mr. Cherry was coming. Mr. Cherry went to the jail. He said, uh, he asked for the tenants committee chair. They brought him up and he said, Mayor Lindsay sent me to bring you home. Now, just think of something like that happening today. The Bill de Blasio tried it a couple of years ago. That's that. true, that's true. <laughs> had a version of that just recently. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> in, uh, in, in, in time capsule fashion, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I've asked a few of you. I think I asked Jay. I think I asked Sid. I said, look, have they, have, have they called you up from City Hall? Have they asked you for a little wisdom, a little advice, and so forth? And, um, and, and I know you all are, st in some cases, still very active and involved. But give some advice to uh, the kids who are there now. There are, there are a lot of young people who are uh, going into government for the first time, they're riding on what they think is a, a wave of, uh, of popular enthusiasm. We'll see how that works out. Um, and, and they've got some ideas. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's, it's meaningful that today happens to be the day that Mayor de Blasio signed his first piece of legislation into law, and it's the, uh, the paid sick leave law. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is why they, uh, a lot of these kids got into public service. This is gonna be what they tell some audience about 40 years from now. What, what's, uh, what's your advice to them? We've uh, we talked in the earlier panel a little bit about some of the common things between de Blasio and John Lindsay, but one of them we didn't quite hit. That's the difficulty of working with a governor of your own party who's quite gifted and is thinking about running for president, which we left out of the comparison. On many of the big issues, the mayor of New York by himself can do relatively little, especially the big economic and the inequality issues. So I would say to the young people in that administration, think early about building allies statewide and think strategically about your, how you're going to enlist the state. I had an experience that very few people have had. Approximately a year after John Lindsay left office, Hugh Carey asked me to be his budget director. For those of you with weak memories, that was with cymbals and drums, the beginning of the fiscal crisis. And once you ripped the outer layer off the structure of the city and the state, I was amazed. And I should have known this from my city days, but I didn't. It's not know how intertwined the city and the state are. Here's a number that you don't find in Joe's book and that you don't find in any briefing for city and state officials. Roughly 75% of state and New York City expenditures are on the same things, on the same systems of care service, governed very often by either two layers or one layers of rule. So you've got to have a strategy for that. You've got to watch the opportunity function. When I was growing up, there were three or four funnels of opportunity in this country. John Lindsay was very interested in opportunity. These were ladders by which people who wanted to make their way could get a job, get a decent living, buy a house. Some of them got retirement plans. Without realizing it, because we don't think structurally in this country, we've begun to close off those funnels of opportunity. The growth of state and local government employment around the country. The draft in the Army, which used to reach way down, doesn't reach way down anymore. The growth in the health sector, which we've got to change, because we can't carry the kind of increasing health sector we've got. And an area that nobody mentioned in either panel that the Lindsay administration helped open up higher education. Those are the four government created and managed funnels of opportunity in this country and we have been choking them off. So in a city with a leader like the body, we've got to watch those four funnels and begin to think how to get some of them working again. I want to make one other comment on Joe's book. It's a good book. You should read this book. Even for those of us who were there for some of the time, it opened it up. It was really good. <laughs> There's a wonderful point that makes me a little bit sad about my country because we're so divided and so paralyzed now. He says that both now and during the Lindsay years, there was to some degree the spending of money we didn't have. I'm an old budget director, but I got to admit that was a little bit true. But Joe goes on. When Lindsay was mayor, we spent it for the poor and those in need. And today, we spend it to help the rich. Mm. Yeah. I liked the, your last comment, Peter. I had no idea what you said before that. Just, uh, <laughs> nothing changes. If we gave that advice to someone in City Hall, like when I was out, I had no idea what you said. Anyway. <laughs> Peter and I never agreed on anything. Uh, and then Jay took over. But, uh, you know, t t to me, it's, it's the fight. One thing about uh, us is that 
we really believed. It was, that was our time. That was, John Lindsay made us believe. I think Bill DeBiaso will make us believe. He, he is, he is, he's got a program, he wants to do it, and every day they're gonna get up, some young assistant is gonna get up and get beat over the head, uh, be in the front line, and you just, when you go be to bed that night, you get up the next day, it's, a ne it's, it's, it's another day. You gotta, you gotta take the punches and you gotta really, you know, if you really feel that you're right, uh, there'll be good days. There'll be a lot more bad days, but those good days that come are great. So just, it's just getting up and, and fighting every day. Ron. Well, I, I was just thinking you can see from the four of us that we're so different and that, that, that the government included all of us and we all participated in it, and I love every one of them, but I agree with you. Sometimes I didn't understand some of them, but um, <laughs> I think um, to listen to everybody, I think that's very important. If somebody calls your office, you listen to them. I mean, somebody called and wanted a canoe because they were going to liberate the Statue of Liberty. Uh, <laughs> but you still talk to them. That's what's so important. And people have, they're, they're sources of great information for you. And I think that they have to res have respect for people. Some people who continually complain or some people who are that one item like me, but um, uh, you've got to listen to them and you've got to respect them and include them in what your thinking is going to be. I think that's, there, there shouldn't be a sense of superiority or, you know, we know best. Uh, I remember in 1966, at a, a very young age, John Lindsay called me one day and said, would you do me a favor? Would you meet with this old friend of mine who wants to talk to you about the LaGuardia administration and give you some ideas and advice of what we should do, and you meet with him, I don't want to. And uh, he was a very old guy, probably in his late 50s. <laughs> and and uh, we sat there for an hour, and I, I have to say, and he droned on endlessly, a little like Peter, and I had no idea what he was saying. And I, I just remember, I, I can remember it today, saying to myself, please, Lord, when I'm his age, don't ever let me sit with young people at City Hall telling him what it was like in the Lindsay era. And I was having lunch with one of de Blasio's young aides, a little older than I was, but roughly comparable, and starting to tell her about some things that, that we had done, and suddenly stopped and said, let me, let me just figure this out. LaGuardia ended 20 years before Lindsay started. If I go back to when Lindsay ended compared to, to de Blasio, which is 40 years, <laughs> the mayor for us would have been John Highland. <laughs> so what would it have been like if Lindsay had said, please talk to this guy who worked for John Highland and say, so I'm, I've stopped giving advice to the de Blasio kids. Okay, you know, well. Errol, you, you, you had a great um, ending here, but we never mentioned the Vietnam War and the veterans coming back and the drug problem that we faced in the city and what happened. I mean, those were incredible no, things one. that have never been right, never mentioned. Okay, you want to, tomorrow night, meet you here at the same place. <laughs> <laughs> the yes, the red light is on, so <laughs> right. we're going we're gonna to make that the last Sorry. word. Thank you Let's all stand so up much. And hold it. Come on. Stand up.